The book of Revelation discusses a little book with a thunderous message. God revealed the truth about the little book thousands of years ago to the apostle John, but God also told John not to write it down. Learn why the little book was kept secret until this end time. Prove that the little book shows where God is working today. Next on The Key of David with Gerald Flurry. Greetings, everyone. In the 10th chapter of Revelation of the Bible, it describes a little book and uh, what, what that little book is all about. It actually comes on the scene when the Church of God is experiencing the greatest crisis, perhaps the greatest crisis ever. And certainly it is the greatest crisis in terms of numbers because more members rejected God in that at this time than any other era of God's church. The little book also comes on the scene when world events are in the worst crisis ever. It's never been worse. And the little book also comes on the scene just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it is, it is actually even a sign of the second coming of Jesus Christ. So there is good news, a lot of good news in this little book. And there, that's all explained in chapter 10 of Revelation, the book of Revelation. And uh, it, the conclusion is in Revelation chapter 11. But it, there it talks about the little book having seven thunders. I mean, seven clasps of the worst possible thunder you could hear warnings indeed warnings and at the end very good news but seven warnings really and the uh, when the angel cry, cries out it says that it's like a lion's roar and it really ought to get our attention God wants it to get our attention that's why you have all of these vivid descriptions we need to get it needs to get our attention. Now, why is this little book so important to you? Why is it so important to you? Why is it so critical to you? Because it shows you exactly where God's work is. And it shows you precisely where the message of God is, is going out from or emanating from the... the uh, place in this world? Where is it? What does it mean to you? I mean, it's, a, it's going to reveal where God is, and what's more important than that? So what is this little book? Where is it today? Notice Revelation 10 and verse 1. It, it begins describing the little book here. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was, as it were, the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Now, this is an interesting little verse, and uh, the, this angel's face looked like the sun. And what does that tell you about you? Well, if you look at Hebrews 2, verses 7 and 8, God says He's going to put us over all things. That is, man is going to be created as, as, as members of God's family, sons in God's family, and they'll have more brilliance and more power and more might than angels. And yet it says angels have face, faces that shine like the sun. What does that uh, tell you about your future? if you're loyal to God and want to live God's way. The potential of man is just truly, uh, well, mind shredding. <laughs> it's just that great. But uh, it, this little book also has a rainbow uh, upon its head, or the angel does, and uh, well, there's a rainbow around God's throne. So it's letting us know that this is coming from God's throne. And it's that important that it's coming directly from God's throne. Then verse 2 it says, And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the earth. That's verse 2, on the sea and the earth. In other words, this is for the whole world. And 
Then verse 3 is when the cry of the angel sounds like a lion's roar. You have this one blast of thunder after another, seven thunders. And then you have this, this angel crying out like a lion's roar. This must be terribly important, and it must be a warning we should heed. How could you not see it any uh, that way? The seven thunders, seven is a number of completion. Once those thunders are completed, Jesus Christ returns to this earth, and those thunders are already sounding, and you're, uh, you're hearing them if you're listening spiritually. All seven of them. And we need to really take note of that. Verse 4, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. So it was revealed over 1900 years ago, but God didn't want it written down then. And He told John not to write it down, but today He says it would be written down, and we must know where it is and what it is, or we can't even understand the book of Revelation. We must know this. God put it there for us to know in this end time. And you can prove that it's very much on the scene. You can absolutely prove this because it's for this end time, and it has been written now. Verses 5 and 6, And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea, and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swore by him that lives for ever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that therein are, and the earth. This is the source of the little book. How could we not heed that message? And the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, and that there should be time no longer. It really means no more delay. There, there's going to be a great change in, in God's own church and in world events. They're going to move much faster than they ever have in the history of man. Have you noticed a super fast movement of events in this end time, let's say from five years ago or ten years ago? or 15 years ago, it's phenomenal. The changes that are coming upon this world so rapidly, that's exactly what the little book is talking about. No more delay, no more holding things back, no more slow movement, just racing ahead like, uh, well, the speed of lightning. So there's a reason, you see, why this is all happening, though. This is all this no more delay, it really revolves out of, around the casting down of Satan and his demons, and, and then they became uh, confined to this earth, all of them, millions of them. And that big change in world events and in God's church is because of that, because of Satan being cast down. You can see Revelation 12, verses 7 through 12, where it talks about uh, the, this Satan that rose up to fight God and try to overthrow his throne. And then they were cast out. They lost and they were cast out and, and totally removed from every place except this earth. And now they're confined to this earth. And that's why, that's the main reason why you see events in this world racing along so fast. But who believes these prophecies of God? That Revelation 12 follows immediately after the vision of Revelation 10 and 11 about the little book. It's all falling into place, and we must know what it means or we won't understand where we are in Bible prophecy, and we won't understand precisely what is happening and where God is working and what He is doing. How important is that, would you say? 
Verse 8, And the voice which I heard from heaven spoke unto me again, and said, Go, and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make your belly bitter, and it shall be in your mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter." Now what, is, what does that mean? What is that all about? Well, God commands His people, His very elect, you take that little book and you eat it up, you digest it, and it's going to be sweet as honey in your mouth, but then it's going to be very bitter in your belly. In other words, there's good news and there's bad news. But the uh, good news overshadows the bad news by far. But how can you uh, really digest this great message if you don't really study it and understand it and prove where it is? We must know where it is and digest it and see why it's as sweet as honey in our mouths and as bitter as can be in our bellies. Why is that? We must know or we don't understand Bible prophecy like we should. The little book is critical for you to understand where God is working today and where His message is. Now, He, he said Himself, in this end time, this little book is going to be revealed. It has been, and we can prove that to you. But you must know what it is and where it is. See, if you're going to be protected by God from these terrible events that are racing along and getting much worse, many times over, a hundredfold over just a few years ago, it seems. But God says, look, I will protect you if you will heed what that little book says. And we're going to send it to you today if you request it, and you can prove that it is this little book of Revelation 10. Notice verse 11, after we digest a little book, what do we do? Well, here's, here's the answer. And He said unto me, You must prophesy again before or concerning and about many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So there's a, a lot happening, and God says, now those people that have the little book are going to be out there prophesying again, the way somebody had prophesied before, and then that work was destroyed, and a new work had to be raised up to prophesy again. What is that all about? Well, the little book will explain that to you, and you it will make it uh, really, really uh, starkly clear to your understanding. So this is a, just a mind-bending uh, message. Now that little book is Malachi's message to God's church today, a book that we have and that we'll send to you, and, it will, and you'll see why it's a little book. And then there's, there's a companion booklet entitled, The Little Book, and it explains to you what the little book is. Now. Here's an amazing miracle. That little book was written before we even knew anything about it, the title being the little book. And, uh, and it, we didn't know any, uh, there was not anything known about the seven thunders. That's what we can prove to you. So what does that mean? Well, it means that God is orchestrating all this. It's not a work of men. This is what God says He would do in this end time. No man can do that. Men can do nothing apart from God. But here God says, I'm going to do this in this end time. I'll make it unfold piece by piece by piece, and then you will see where the little book is. You must know it has a, a, a message that is for this entire earth, and particularly for God's own people. 
So we'll hope, hope that you'll request both of those. You really do need both of them to understand this. I just explain that to you because, uh, look, uh, only God can reveal something like this. And it is for this end time. It's for us today. And that little book is on this earth and is being used. And you can prove all of that and wh how inspiring and how sweet as honey is it in your mouth. But there is some bad news as well. That's what the seven thunders are all about, except the conclusion, the concluding clasp of thunder, which is the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's the best news we could possibly hear. But where is that little book, and what is it? Well, now we can, we can, you can prove that to yourself. This is a, a little book that has seven thunders. I'll just quickly go through those seven thunders. The first one is the Laodicean era, or the lukewarm era. In other words, uh, Satan has literally taken over God's church, and the people have become lukewarm, 95% of them. And there's only a little remnant, a little 5% that are willing to get out there and deliver God's message because they have the little book. They have been given the little book, and God says then once you have that little book, you've got to get out there and prophesy again. There's a work that has to be done. There's a work and a message that has to go out to the entire earth. And that's why God is, is, uh, is using us today if we're do, uh, getting that message out. And that's why He protects us. Because He rewards us for doing the work when it is a work that most people will only receive as a witness and not do with it what they should. That's just the way it is and the way it's always been with God's message. Number two, the thunder is following Elijah or the end time Elijah or the man who preached the gospel around the world, the man who became, that's Matthew 24 and verse 14. And this man also came before the great and the dreadful day of the Lord. Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6, this man also restored all things. Matthew 17, verses 10 and 11, but then Satan literally overwhelmed the church of God and destroyed that work for 1150 days, and then God raised up that little remnant, and there was the little book that came on the scene and cleansed the sanctuary, as Daniel 8 says. And you can read that uh, in our booklet on the uh, you know, about Daniel that we have that we'll give to you. It's uh, Daniel unsealed at last. And you need to understand that. It's all very clear if you just study into your Bible. Number three is the Joshua thunder. Now this is some thunder because here is the, the most pathetic uh, seen probably inside God's church because the very the high priest in God's own church is in bondage to the devil. That's why the church was taken over and how it was taken over. I mean, the one the person or being that is in the spotlight here throughout is Satan the devil. But God, of course, is in control of everything. Satan just keeps appearing again and again and again. Thunder number four is the man of sin, or the son of perdition, the son of destruction. That is a title that was given only to Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus Christ, and as a result he became possessed by Satan the devil. And that's an indication that there's a man on this earth in this end time that will have the same problem. That's why he's called the son of perdition. The only other man who has that title is Judas Iscariot, the man who became possessed by Satan the devil. And you can see in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 where it talks about at Christ's coming, this son of perdition would come on the scene. And it will show you there where Satan entered into Judas and how it all happened anciently and how is it 
uh, how it's going to happen in this end time. That man, it says in verse 4, actually exalts himself above God. Now you know something's wrong if that's the case. That's 2 Thessalonians 2, and all that will be explained to you in the little book. It's emphasized. And even Lang's commentary will tell you that 2 Thessalonians 2 is about the spirit of Satan. And it, it's, uh, it's, it's all empowered by Satan's energy. And Satan's, Satan is motivating and moving and, and doing it all himself. He actually got inside God's own church and really, really got control of a man. Now that's a, a great danger. God calls it the mystery of iniquity or the mystery of lawlessness. That's just of the devil. That's what it's about. It, it, verse 9 in 2 Thessalonians 2 talks about the wicked. The King James Version capitalizes the, the W. They know it, it refers to Satan the devil, that son of perdition being used by Satan the devil, and then it goes on to talk about the lie, it should read, and does in the Greek, in verse 11, that strong delusion about the lie, which is actually Satan showing himself and actually convincing a lot of people that he is God. He comes as an angel of light, and yet people don't understand that, and that's why they're so deceived by him. Revelation 11 and verse 1 talking about the inner court and the outer court. The inner court or the inner temple is where God dwells. The outer court is where the rest of God's people are, 95% of them in the outer court. They're not where God dwells. They're lukewarm. They've rebelled against God. They've rejected God's precious truth. That's why we had the 1150 days of the work being destroyed, and it had to be resurrected. We had to raise up the ruins. Number five is prophesy not. That's what the church uh, that rejected God did. And that'll all be explained to you. They just rejected prophecy, they said, no, don't prophesy. And yet God says in Revelation 10 and verse 11, you prophesy again. He always says prophesy. But men, naturally, don't, don't like that. They don't want to be prophesying. They want to be enjoying the sins of this world, quote, unquote. There's a very short-term enjoyment because those sins bring hor horrible prophecies to pass and pain to the people who disobey God. We need to understand that. Number six is a church division. There's a split in the church. That's explained in Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2. Inner court, outer court. The church is split and should not be. Then we have in the seventh thunder, Malachi's message. That is the little book. Malachi's message. Let me just read to you about that church split. Verse 1 of chapter 11. Given me a reed like unto a rod, he has authority, this some man does. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. Rise up, rise up and measure the temple. And he says, That court which is without is going to be given over to the Gentiles. In the times of the Gentiles, because they rebelled against God and they became lukewarm and they wouldn't deliver God's message, they said, prophesy not, instead of doing what God said. And he says, prophesy again. Let me just read to you one last scripture here in Revelation 11 and verse 15. This is the same vision of uh, the little book. And I want to show you the wonderfully good news that God has for you and for all of us. Notice this best news you could ever possibly hear. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Now there's the good news. See, this, uh, there's, a, there's certainly a quite a lot of bad news here. But God is saying, now you, you have to have the vision to see the end of all this. 
the kingdoms of this world, those evil kingdoms that are getting nuclear bombs and hating each other and wanting to destroy each other, that can't go on or there would be no flesh saved alive, as it says in Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22. There would be no flesh saved alive. But Jesus Christ is going to make sure there, there is flesh saved alive. There are people saved alive. And the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of God. And all of this about the little book is just a preface to the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. It's a sign of the second coming of Jesus Christ and it shows you exactly what Christ is doing now and what He's going to continue to do until His second coming. Until next week, this is Gerald Flurry. Goodbye, friends. Request The Little Book to identify this book and its astounding implications for every human being. You will also receive a copy of Gerald Flurry's free book, Malachi's Message. All our literature is available free of charge at no cost or obligation to you. Order now.